Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, before now, that we should walk in them. See, we should be walking in good works. We should be walking in what God prepared for each and every one of us. Because that is the high calling of God. Romans chapter 11 verse 29 says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The calling of God is irrevocable in our life. You know, over the years there have been many famous musicians. And some have, some have uh, turned their life over to Christ and some have not. But many of those musicians are anointed of God, whether they recognize it or not. You know, it, they were given the talents, and we're going to talk about the tra talents in a few minutes, but they were given the talent. They were given that by God. You know, I, I, I'm not really what you would call a, a talented musician. I... I can play a trumpet, but I'm not uh, terribly talented at it. I just, uh, I just play. But see, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. When I was 12 years old, 13 years old, someplace in there, I was at a youth camp, and uh, one night, after the service, several of us stayed at the altar and prayed. And as we were praying, God called me into the ministry. And I didn't want to be in the ministry. And I fought that. For years, I fought that. And I did all kinds of things to show God that he didn't really want me. But the calling of God on my life was irrevocable. And uh, God directed me, directed me. I, I, I came back to the Lord a few years later. And uh, I was contented with going to church and being a Sunday school teacher and, and uh, you know, doing a little here and a little there. But I, I was contented with that. And God directed me unknowing. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. He directed me to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I thought I was going out there to get a good job and spend the rest of my life there. And I got to Tulsa. And I was staying with some people. Actually, a, a former pastor from here in Greenville. And I was staying with him, and he took me to church. And I, as we were in church together, I was hearing about this, this Bible training school. And so every week when we went to church, I was hearing about this, this Bible training institute, and... Uh, so I, you know, I, when my wife and kids came out to Tulsa, we started going to that same church, 
And as we attended the church and, and sort of gotten involved with it, I decided to go to the Bible training school. Now, I still didn't want to be a, in ministry. But I thought, well, it won't hurt me to learn the Bible more. And as I started going to that school, the calling of God on my life began to really show up. And so when I attended the school, I realized that I had to give my life totally over to him. See, he has a plan for our lives. It's a, it's a destiny and a purpose. And now, it, it, there's a lot of controversy over the word predestination. But he has predestined for your life. For your life. He has a destiny and a purpose. It's a high calling because it comes from him. And we have a choice whether to walk in this high calling or reject it. And as I said, you know, I, I rejected that high calling for many years. But, but once, I, once I stepped into it, then the anointing of God began to flow to me and through me. And, and, and every one of you, has a call on your life. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter, you know, what church you attend or whether you attend church at all. There is a high calling on your life. It's a place of assignment that God has given to you. God has assigned you a job. And... When you, when you step into that high calling, <clears throat> there's a reward that comes from God. When he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. See, as we're faithful to do what God has called us to do, he looks at us and says, well done. And every person that hears this message needs to know there is a call of God on your life. You need to be aware of that high calling. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If we go to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to start with verse 14 down through verse 30. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And whether you are aware of it or not, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a part of the kingdom of heaven. So, Let's, let's read this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to his own abilities. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. 
enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of heat teeth. As God has given you talents, and you say, well, I'm not a very talented person. Yes, you are. God has given you a talent. You know, I know I know many people who have good singing voices, but they won't sing in public because of fear and 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 nervousness and all that. Well, see, Satan comes to take your talent if he can. And he will bring a spirit of fear on you. If you allow it, if you allow it, see he can't he can't do to us what we don't allow. Now you say, well, then pastor, why do we get sick? Well, we allow it. You know, we do things that open the door. And and you say, well, I I I I'm I'm faithful to God. I I I don't open the door to the devil. Well, somehow here or another he gets in. You know, and if we look at the at the uh, parable of the sheepfold, and, and we're not going to turn there today, but if we look at that parable of the sheepfold, the good shepherd, you know, the the sheepfold is a is a is a building that there is only one entrance where the sheep go in and out. And the good shepherd, when he when he does sleep, he puts all the sheep in the building. So they're they're in there where they're safe. There's there's nothing can get in any place except the doorway. And the good shepherd sleeps in the doorway. So that nothing can get into that sheepfold because it's protected by the good shepherd. And Jesus is the good shepherd of our lives. Well, why don't we, why, why do we get attacked? We do things that take us out of the fold. We, we, we do things, we're not, we're not, walking in the high calling all the time. You know, as as I teach students and 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 have to minister more often, I find myself more aligned with what the purpose that God has given me. God has called me to be a teacher. He he told me. He told me in 1984. That's a long time ago, I know. But he told me very clearly, I want you to go and train believers to do the work of the ministry. And see, when you say ministry, a lot of people... 
uh, step back. Why? Well, because that word ministry brings to our mind, not our spirit, our mind, the, the idea that you have to put on a suit, you have to stand in a pulpit, and you have to preach to a congregation. Well, that is a form of ministry, but God has not called every person to be part of the five-fold ministry. You know, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And you may not be called to one of those offices. You may be. But you're, you're called to an office. Every believer is called to be a minister. You know, it, 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 it irritates me when I drive by a church and I see the sign that says so-and-so is the minister. No. That person is the pastor. The ministers are sitting in the pews. Yes, the pastor is a minister also. But the ministers are sitting in the pews. And those of you that are hearing this message today, you need to understand that just because you're maybe sitting in the pew today, so to speak, doesn't mean you're not called to ministry. It doesn't matter where you are when you're hearing this message. You know, you could be laying in bed, but you're still called to the ministry. Well, what ministry am I called to? I don't know. Ask God. He'll tell you. Just as he called me. He will tell you. But see, we have to learn to walk, <coughs> to walk in that high calling. We have to learn how to walk in it. Philippians chapter 3, starting with the 12th verse down through verse 14. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as ha to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, you don't have to be perfect to be a minister. Paul's saying here, I, 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 I'm not perfected. He said, I'm not perfect. Why? Well, apparently Paul had things in his life that he had not completely overcome. You know, whether it be, whether it be whatever, language, uh, some addiction, it could, it could be anything like that. But he said, you know, I, I can't get caught up in my past. I have to press forward into that high calling. And he said, you know, there, there, there's three things here that he said. First of all, press. You have to, you have to push into that high calling in your life. Well, what's it mean to press? Well, God has called me to do things I didn't want to do. You know, he, he has spoken things to me. Uh, go pray for this person. Go pray for that person. Go, go minister here. Go minister there. Go to other countries. Go to places you don't... You know, I, I went to the Dominican Republic a few years ago, and I was used to, in, in Brazil, you know, somebody would 
take me, some, somebody that I knew would take me wherever I needed to go. Well, when I got to the Dominican Republic, they took me out and put me on a bus. And I was the only person on the bus that could speak English. Nobody else spoke English. And I didn't even know where I was going. And fear started to come in. And I said, no, I, whatever, whatever, whatever I need to do, I'm going to go. See, I had to press to get on that bus. And the, the, the person who was sending me on the bus, had taken me to the bus, had told the bus driver where to let me off. He let me off in the wrong place. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know where, I, you know, I, all I knew is that I needed to go to Pastor Johnson's church. And I didn't know Pastor Johnson. And I didn't know where Pastor Johnson's church was. And so, here I am, stranded. In a, in a strange country with people that don't speak my language and I, and I don't speak theirs. And God sent a man who spoke good English, a man who had actually lived in the United States for a few years, and he spoke good English, and God sent him to me. And he began to talk to me about, and, and he didn't know Pastor Johnson, and he didn't know where Pastor Johnson's church was. And, I, and when it started out, he wasn't even a Christian. He is now. Because I, I began to minister to him as we talked. And so he said, well, you know, who do you know that you can contact? And I said, well, I, you know, I, I, I know this pastor that, that brought me here to the Dominican Republic, but he doesn't speak English either. And he said, I'll tell you what, you get him on the phone and I'll talk to him. And you talk about being pressed. I was being pressed right then. You know, you talk about people sh uh, 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 sweating bullets. I was sweating bullets. But we got a hold of the pastor who was back in the other city. And he talked to him for a while and, and he hung up the phone and he said, no worries. There's somebody coming to get you. And a pastor who I had ministered for uh, the week before, or two weeks before, showed up, and he was a man that spoke English, praise God. He showed up and he said, well, we're going to take you to Pastor Johnson's church, and it was in the next city. And we walked into the church, the, the service was halfway over. Because Pastor Johnson had gone ahead and, and began the service. But see, as you press forward into the high calling in your life, God will send people to you that you need in order to do the job that you have to do. And he will send angels if he has to, to show you what it is you need to do. You say, angels? Well, why would he send angels? The Word tells us that, that many times we'll see angels unaware. In other words, we won't know they're angels. I was in a service one time, and a person walked in the back and sat down. And they had like a, a Mexican serape on, which was kind of odd for where we were. 
Uh, but that's that's what he had on. And he sat in the back, and we went through the service. And after the service, I, I was praying for people. We had not closed out the service. We were just, I was just praying for people. And I look up, and that man had disappeared. And to this day, I think it was an angel that walked into that service. See, God will send to you those that you need to help you. Okay, let's move forward. The second thing that, that Paul says here is that you must forget those things that are behind. Maybe somebody has made fun of you in the past. Maybe someone has teased you. You know, when I was in elementary school, they, uh, the music teacher, had each of us sing a couple bars of a song. And when I sang, she looked at me and said, you're not going to be a singer. And it, it hurt, because I had done my best. It hurt. And for years, I refused to sing where anybody could hear my voice. I just wouldn't do it. And we would be in services, and, and everybody singing loud, and I'd just mouth the words. I wouldn't let my voice come out. But I finally gave that to God. And those of you who are on the Zoom uh, today, you know that you have heard me singing because I gave it to God and I allow, and if my voice is bad, well, it's bad. That's all, that's all there is to it. But I'm still going to sing and I'm going to praise God. Because I'm not going to allow my past to hold me back. Amen. You can't allow things that have happened in your past to hold you back from your future. Because you have a future. God, God has given you a future. And He'll bless you. And so you have to... Forget what people have said. You've got to forget what has happened in your past. Okay, you say, well, Pastor, you didn't forget what that teacher said. No, but I have overridden it, which works just as well. See, because the next part is you have to reach forward. You have to reach forward to what's ahead. You have to, to reach for those things that will, that will bless you. You have to reach for those things that will use you to bless others. There are, God has a blessing in your future. You know, I see these things on, on Facebook if, or, or any social media, you know, if you copy and paste this, you know, in three days, God's going to pour out a blessing on you. Well, that's a, a bunch of baloney. But if you press and forget and reach forward, God will bless you. He wants to bless you. You know, if people try to work for the blessings of God and, 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 oh, God, I did this for you, so will you do this for me? No, 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 no. That's not how this works at all. God wants to bless you. He wants to pour out blessings on you. Those of you who have children or those of you who are, are married... You know, 
you want to bless those children. You want to bless your spouse. You want to, you want to bless them. And and you want to surprise them with presents and, and things. You know, you want to do nice things for them. My son got a nice pair of boots for Christmas. Leather boots for work. And he wanted to protect them. And he, and he said, Dad, you know, what, what do I do to protect these boots? What do I do for, for protection on them? And I said, well, you know, you got to put oil on them and, and, and oil them. And, and he said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get some oil. Well, I turned around and ordered the oil. And when it came, I said, here, this package is for you. Well, what is it? Well, it's the oil for your boots. Oh, Dad, you didn't need to do that. You, you didn't need to get it. I was going to buy it myself. You see, I wanted to bless him. I wanted to bless that child because I love him. And, and you know, you do things for your wife. Tomorrow's Valentine's Day, praise God. <laughs> well, we want to bless our, our, our wife or our husband or our girlfriend or whatever, wherever you're at. You want to bless that person, you know, and, and so what do we do? Well, you know, we send our wife flowers or candy or do all that stuff. Why? Because you want to bless them. Well, see, God, your father, wants to bless you. And so when we press and forget and reach forward, we walk into blessings that, that we're not we're not even uh, aware that they're, they're going to come. What kind of things will hold you back from the high calling? Well, there are three main things. The world, your flesh, and the devil. Three things. You know, I heard this the other day, and, and, and I honestly don't remember who I was talking to at the time. But it, but it, it hit me in the, in, in the spirit realm. It, it really did. It hit me. And it's like, wow, you're right. You know, it, and that's this. We, we have this opinion that Satan runs a kingdom and that all these demons work for the devil and that's not necessarily so he doesn't have any power remember Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 28 that all power in heaven and on earth is given to me. And then he, he gave it to the believers to go out and do the work of the ministry. So if he has all the power, then Satan doesn't have any. There are principalities and powers of darkness in high places, but 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 they're they're set up the way they are, and and I'm not saying that that Satan didn't do all this, but he didn't create anything. He can't create. Only God can create. Satan is a liar, and he wants you to think that he has all kinds of power. He doesn't have power. So anyhow, let's look at some scriptures as to things that will hold you back. If you look at Mark chapter 14, verse 38, we're talking about the flesh here. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> Boy, that's no joke. 
You know, the, the, the flesh is weak. Paul said, Paul said, uh, I do the things that I don't want to do instead of doing the things that I should be doing. In other words, you know, Paul, like, like all the rest of us, he would from time to time do something that was sinful. <gasps> the apostle Paul sinned? Hey, he was a man just like the rest of us. And, you know, sometimes we do things that we shouldn't do instead of doing the things we should do. I just saw a, a uh, photograph last night of a young, and, and I have to uh, talk about the races here, and I'm not being racist, I'm just, I, this is what I saw. A young white man who was bloodied and beaten. And, and he, I mean, he, he was, uh, you could tell that he'd been in a terrible fight. Well, the story is that this young man got on the bus of the Freedom Riders back in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And Everybody else on the bus was black. And they they rode into Alabama on this bus. And, and he was the only white person on the bus. And when they got to where they were going, there was a mob who was going to attack these black people as they came off the bus. And he turned around and he looked at all the people on the bus and he said, y'all just stay here. I'm going to go out and take the beating. And so he stepped off the bus and he took the beating that the mob was prepared to hand out. so that the people on the bus were protected. And as I looked at that picture, I thought, Alan, would you do that? Would you do that? And, uh, you know, when it comes to taking a beating, my flesh is a little weak. I, I try to stay away from fights. And I, I, I really searched myself. Do you have the, the intestinal fortitude to step forward and protect those people that are behind you? And the answer I've come to is, like Paul and Silas, you know, I want to be able to sing in the prison after I've had a beating. I want to be able, I want to be able to do that. Do it. You know, I don't want to have to take the beating, but at the same time, if I take it, I'm still going to praise God. But see, my, my flesh is weak. My spirit's willing. Oh, in the spirit, I'm willing. To, uh, yes, praise God. I'll go. I'll go. I'll do. I'll uh, whatever. God, put me on a bus and send me places. But my flesh kind of wants to step back and say, "Oh, wait a minute." But see, that's where you have to press. Now you have to press into that high calling. Okay, let's 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 step on. Talking about the world. Mark chapter 4 verse 19. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The word becomes unfruitful. Yeah, if you allow other stuff to choke it out. 
the cares of this world. If if you look at, at Matthew chapter 6, you know, verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And if you, you back up to verse 25, talks about all the things of the world that we think about, you know, clothing and food and, and housing and all that stuff that that we think, well, you know, I have to take care of this. I, 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 I have to have new clothes. I have to... I have to look good. I have to. I have to have a nice home. You know, I, 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 I want a, a, a three-story mansion. I want a nice home. I want this. I want that. I want to have a nice car. I, I don't want to have, drive an old clunker. Well, what happens is we get so caught up in taking care of the things of the world that we don't take care of the things of the word. And that's why we have to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he'll bless you and all the things that you desire will be added unto you. Are you with me? Glory to God. Amen. If we look at Luke chapter 8 verse 12. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. What do they hear? Well, they hear the word. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, of course, this is part of the, the, the parable of the, the vine and how we have to be in the vine. And, or, I'm sorry, the parable of the sower and how the sower sows the seed. And, and how, you know, it, it immediately takes root when somebody hears the word, but then the devil comes along and he steals it. That's, how does he do that? Well, he says, you know, you don't, you don't really have to go to church. You can be a Christian without going to church. Well, I'm going to tell you this, and, the, and I'm going to use this example. You build a nice fire in your fire pit, and you've got the logs all arranged and, and everything, and, and the, the fire's going, and it's a nice fire and everything, and you take one log and you pull it out. It doesn't take a real long time before the, that log goes out. And it's no longer burning. It just goes out. Why? Because it has to be with the other logs in order to burn. You have to have more than one log together to have a nice fire. Well, what happens in people's lives is the devil tells them, well, you don't have to go to church. The first thing you know, they find themselves going to places they should not go. They... They find themselves going to do things, doing things that they did before they were born again. They, they catch themselves doing these things. Why? Well, because they're not together with other believers who are strengthening and helping one another. See, if your church that you attend, whatever church it is, your church that you attend, the believers in that church don't don't care for one another, don't strengthen one another, don't minister to each other. You're going to the wrong church. You need to find a place where the people care for one another. You need to find a place where, where, you know, I see people after church laying hands on other people. Oh, well, isn't that the pastor's job? No, that's the minister's job. And remember, I told you the ministers are the ones sitting in the pews. 
That's not necessarily the pastor's job. Yes, it is his job, but only as a minister of the gospel, as you all should be if you're born again. If you're not born again, you need Jesus in your life. You say, well, I, I don't understand this born again stuff. You have to accept Jesus into your heart. It's very simple. You know, the word says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead and he's the son of God, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, is your Savior, you shall be saved. And and. and you know, we think, oh, you know, I have to, I have to go up front in church, and I have to do this, and I have to. No, all you have to do is accept Jesus in your heart and tell somebody that you've accepted Him in your heart. Then, after that, is when we repent for our sins. What's repent mean? Well, it means turn away, turn the other direction. So, what do we do? Well, we turn away from our sin. And we go and, 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 and we go forward into the ministry that God's called you to. And that doesn't mean you have to go to special school. That doesn't mean you have to do anything. You have to get into the Word and spend time with God. You know, when, when my father was alive, I loved spending time with my dad. And we would go places and we would do things. And, and sometimes we would just sit and talk. But I loved spending time with my dad and my mother. Well, if he is our father who art in heaven, should we not enjoy going and spending time with him? Should, should it not be... Something in our heart that, hey, Dad, I want to spend some time with you today. I want to come see you. Yeah, that's why Paul told us we can boldly walk into the throne room of God. Why? So we can go spend time with our dad. <laughs> and we can't allow these things that, that hold us back from the high calling. You know, sometimes peers our peer group, or our jobs, and our relatives stop us from, from spending time with God. I praise God. He gave me a job, uh, a job that I'm doing right now. And uh, I think it was Wednesday night. might have been Thursday night. I don't know. But after, after work, after the office closed down, we had a prayer meeting. And we prayed for one another. And uh, a few weeks ago, I had a sinus infection. My eyes swelled up. The whole office gathered around me, laid hands on me, and prayed for me. That job's not holding me back from being in ministry. Because I, yesterday, I laid hands on a young lady. She came in, she came in where I was, and she said, "Oh, my back hurts so bad." I said, "Turn around." I laid my hand on her and prayed for her. I didn't hear any more about back pain the rest of the day. I don't know what happened. All I know is I laid hands on her. See, I'm not I, I'm not just there to to do the work of the office. I'm there to do the work of God. And He gave me the job to bless me. But sometimes those things will hold us back. And we get so caught up in work, you know, and, and I've been there. I've been a workaholic, and I worked jobs that, that uh, you know, I, I worked myself until I was so tired I couldn't do anything. Not anymore. When it's time to go home, I go home. When it's time to minister to somebody there, I minister to somebody there. I, you know, I, I hear the... The, the the other people in the office 
as as customers and clients come into the office and I hear people back there like praying for them. That's not what they're there for, but you know, I hear people praying for them. Amen. Sometimes our relatives will hold us back. You know, they'll 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 want us to go do things we when God wants us to do something else. Well, I love my relatives. Yeah, I do. But I'm not going to let them hold me back from what God has for me. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read the first 21 verses of this. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Well, what does that mean? Well, when I was little, I used to love to put on my dad's hat, coat. I, he gave me a little briefcase so I could go to work like my dad did. Because I wanted to be like my dad. You know, he got a he got a uh, long dress coat for winter time, and so I had a jacket, you know, with the hood and all that stuff, like you put on little kids. And I said, "Well, I, but I, but but, Mama, I I want a dress coat. I want a long coat that I can wear to church." And my dad worked a job where he had to put on a suit every day. Well, I just, I, I loved putting on a suit because I wanted to be like him. But see, we have to be imitators of God. Well, what does God do? He blesses. He blesses and he doesn't curse. I'm not talking about the words coming out of your mouth so much. But, it, but, he, but he, doesn't, he doesn't bring curses on people. I know there's a train of thought, and, and it's wrong. It's absolutely 100% wrong, you know. Oh, God made me sick in order to teach me something. Would you do that to your kids? Would you? Oh, well, Johnny, you were bad, so we're going to give you diphtheria. Oh, come on. We might, you know, we might. Uh, give the board a correction to their bottom, but that's only, but that's only to train them. You know, it, it's not. It, 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 yeah, you, when you're a child, you think that's terribly painful, but it's really, really uh, not. But see, we want to bless our kids, and God wants to bless you. And and we want, we should be imitating him. Well, how's that? How did we do that? Because by blessing other people, and sometimes the blessing that you give at other people, a, a lot of times, is to give them the word, just as he gave us the word. Because the word is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to to discern between the thought life and the intents of the heart. And he gave us this word. And his, the word's name is Jesus. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Nothing that was made was made without him. And then he became flesh and dwelt among us. God gave us the word. So we need to imitate him and give the word to people. Well, how do you do that? You speak the word to them. You speak the word over their situations. And we walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We sacrifice. 
and we walk in love. You know, there are some people that it's really hard to love them. They're coarse, they're, they're rude, they're bullies. And it, it, it's hard to love them. But you know, when you determine in your heart, you determine in your heart I am going to love people regardless of their attitude. I'm going to love them. I've had people in my church who got angry, called me names, accused me of things I'd never done. And it took a little time. I would sit there and I would smile as they cursed me out. And I'd just smile at them. But it, you know, sometimes what they were saying really cut deep. But I determined that I was going to love those people regardless. I made up my mind to love them. And you know, when I saw them after that, I went over and I put my arms around them and I said, boy, I really miss you. And I'm so happy to see you. And you know what that love did is it it brought the two of us together now whether they come back to the church or not really doesn't make any difference to, I mean to to the church that I pastor it, it really doesn't make a difference what makes a difference is I love those people and I love those people regardless regardless of what happened. But let's let's go on here with, with Ephesians chapter 5. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting What's that mean? Well, that means, you know, uh, a, na a nasty joke, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. You know, over the years, I've heard a lot of dirty jokes. But you can't allow that stuff to get in. You can't allow it to get in. And, you know, I know some people that when they're out with their buddies, they they get involved in the, the joking and the, the coarse language. But, boy, when they come to church, bless God, I'm, I'm a saint here, I'm a saint here, I'm a saint. But when you, you see them outside of church, they live like the rest of the world. That's... That's what this is talking about. We, we should not be doing those kind of things, whatever they are. They're not fitting. They don't, they don't fit a Christian. But rather, we should be giving thanks to God. For, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater why? Because covetousness is idolatry. Oh, well, my neighbor drives a Cadillac, and I got this old clunker, and I want a new Cadillac just like his. I, I, I really want that car. I really want to have that car. What have you done? You've made an idol out of that car. No fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous, 
covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once in darkness, but now you're in light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Oh, yeah, we have to find out what's acceptable. You know, I used to hear people asking questions. Well, can I do this as a Christian? Can I do that as a Christian? What can I do as a Christian? You know, can I, can I go here? Can I do this? Can I? Can... And my answer is, ask God, and the Holy Spirit will tell you. And and He's told me things in my life. You know. Uh, I don't want you doing that anymore. I used to make a joke sometimes when I when I would see patients. You know, I said I, the joke. I would make a joke about it. And one day, when I said that, Holy Spirit said to me, "I don't want you saying that. Don't say that anymore. That's wrong." Wow, I, it was just a joke. No, it's not a joke. It's a word coming out of your mouth, and, and you need to have patience. And you know what has happened? Is as I have quit joking about it, God has given me more patience. Now, don't go to God and pray for patience because you'll find things that will make you impatient. impatient. <laughs> but, but don't say things that against the will of God for your life. Don't say anything that's against them. Because Jesus told us in Mark 11 uh, that you'll have what you say. Well, but pastor, come on. No, you'll have what you say if you believe it in your heart. And see, when we believe in our heart, things that are wrong, what happens? Well, when we speak them, we get them. I hear people saying, oh, you know, this COVID's going around. I'll probably get it. Well, no, I don't want it. Amen. Well, Pastor, didn't you have COVID? Yes, I did. And you know what? Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. That's Amen. all I can say. Thank you, Jesus. You healed me. You know, while I was in the hospital with COVID, two of my friends died of it. Three of my friends died of it. Do you think that that had an impact on me? The devil tried. Oh, look, this one died, that one died, that one died. COVID. And now you have it. You know what I decided? I'm not going to allow you, Satan, to get in and tell me and, and lie to me. I am not going to die of this thing. I am going to live. And I'm going to praise and worship God. And I'm going to do what he called me to do until the day he calls me home. And he hasn't called me home yet. Amen. And you know what? I'm healed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go on here. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. 
for it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. I uh, I knew a pastor that was having an, an affair. He didn't tell me. Holy Spirit told me. As because I was praying for he and his family because I I had heard a a rumor that he and his wife were getting a divorce and splitting up and and I I began to pray for that family. And God had me approach him about it. And I I held back for a long time, but then I had to press in. And I went to him and I said, you know, can I can I help you? Because I understand that that there's a problem in your family. Now he never, he never, you know, we didn't, I didn't go to him and say, well, God's going to get you because you're having an affair. No, that's not how you handle things like that. You allow Holy Spirit to do the, do the correction. All you do is offer to help and, and be available. And, and, and as I be, as I was available to him, you know what? Everything, everything worked out to the good. And he is today pastoring a, 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 a growing, going church. And we are good friends. I consider him to be a very good friend. And I've ministered in his church. I probably will again. But see, all I did was be available to him. And, and to let him know that I was praying for him. And, 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 you know, that's what we have to do, folks. We have to be available. We have to press in and, and go places we don't want to go. Let's go on here with Ephesians chapter 5. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is talking about coming to Christ. This is talking about turning your light over to him. And what's he do? He brings light into your life. He enlightens you by the word. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Why? Because we live in an evil world. So we, we have to walk as, as wise. You say, well, I, you know, I've never been a, a wise person. Well, God says if you lack wisdom, ask of him and he'll give it to you liberally. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In your heart, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, many times God has put a song in my heart. And I don't necessarily have to go around singing that song, but it's in there. And, and as I'm, you know, going through my day, whatever I'm doing, 
that song, a song, and, and, and it's different songs at different times, but that song will just pop into my mind. And it's like, yeah, glory to God, hallelujah. Now, it's not a song, you know, I lost my wife, I lost my dog, I lost my car, I lost my house, and I'm down here in the bar drinking. No, it's a song of praise and worship. It's a song of praise and worship to God. And and like I said, different times, it's different songs. But there are always songs, and they're coming out of my spirit because like I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm not a real singer. I I do sing now, but these songs just just come. Hallelujah. We have to be careful not to walk out of love, like in bitterness or resentment. We have to not take offense all the time. Oh, well, that offended me. That, that offended me. I'm offended by that. Well, get over it. That's all I can say. Get over it. You know, we, we shouldn't be offended all the time. We have to, to learn to, to walk without resentment all the time and bitterness. And... And we can't walk, you know, we can't commit fornication and uncleanness and filthiness and foolish talk. We can't be covetous, you know, coveting what somebody else has. You know, I I knew a man and, and uh, he seemed to have everything. And my mind kind of went like, gee, I'd like to have that. And then I found out that he was bankrupt. And what I saw was just, as we call it, window dressing. But he really didn't have much of anything. I don't covet that. I don't want it. And you know what? Now, whatever you have, I don't want it. I don't, I don't covet what you have. Yeah, I might like it. Yeah, I might like one. But I'm not going to covet yours. You know, I'll go and spend time with you. I know Evan Pippen on here has a... Uh, a side-by-side -side four wheeler. Do I covet his? No. What I want is I want to get one and ride with them. Amen. You know I, why? Well, because it's fun, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I'm I'm thankful that God blessed him with the one he has. And I don't idolize those things. I don't idolize them. Why? Well, because when God's ready to bless me with one, I don't want anything to hold it back. Hallelujah. We can't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We can't fellowship with that stuff. We have to submit ourselves to God. You have to be submitted to him. And you know what happens if you're not submitted to God? Well, depression comes on you. Worry comes on you. Anxiety comes on you. You know, I, 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 I've seen people have anxiety attacks. I mean, they're just so, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Oh, I, oh, give it up. Quit worrying and being anxious. My God is going to take care of you. 
Don't allow depression in your life. If you're depressed, call me. Talk to me. We're going to bind that thing and get it out of your life. You don't have to be depressed. I don't care what's going on in your life. You don't have to be depressed about it. Do you realize that when you worry, you're trying to be God? How am I going to fix this? What am I going to do about this? You know, most of the time, those things that, that, that bring worry into our lives, we can't fix them ourselves anyhow. So what do we do? Well, we allow God to be God and we be his children. And we can't be lukewarm. You know, lukewarms, they have no passion, no fire, no zeal. No we can't, we don't persist. We don't press. We're not faithful. That's what lukewarm is all about. If you read Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, The word says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So that because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll vomit you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I lived in a housing development and we had a nice three-bedroom home. Uh, it was a nice home. It was, a, in my estimation, was a beautiful home. But every morning when I drove out of the development that we lived in, I would see the homes across the road that were around a, a country club, and they were big, beautiful mansions. Beautiful homes, beautiful, beautiful homes. And... I thought, hmm, I'm living in this three-bedroom house across the road, but boy, I'd like to have one of those big mansions. Well, you know what? One morning I drove out there, and I was sitting at the stop sign waiting for traffic. And I was looking at those homes, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And he said, you know, in those homes across there, there are a lot of people that are depressed. And they're worried about whether or not they can pay their bills. And they're, they're uncertain about their future. And a lot of them have turned to alcohol and drugs to try to alleviate those fears. And you know, I don't want that. I don't want that. And from that day forward, I began to pray for those people across the road every morning when I drove out of that, of that, that development. Every morning when I sat at that stop sign, I would pray for those people across the road. Because they were, you know, they, 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 they had the idea, I don't need anything, but they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father. We have to have passion. We have to be passionate about this. We have to have a, a holy zeal, a holy fire. And we have to persist. Regardless of what's going on, we have to persist and, and press and be faithful. We can't be lukewarm. God, God says, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. I, I, you know, you, you're not going to get in if you're just lukewarm. We have to be on fire for Christ. Amen? Amen. We have to Amen. follow the high calling of God in our lives because he has called you with an with a with a calling that is irrevocable. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you, you called us. And Lord, that you, you, you show us what we're called to do. And I just praise you and I honor you for it. Father, I pray that this word today becomes revelation in our heart and light to our mind. And Lord, that we're not lukewarm, but we're on fire and we have a passion and a zeal for you. And we persist in the faith regardless of what happens. And there's no worry, there's no depression, there's no anxiety in our lives. But rather we press forward in Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.